Well, hi. Um, today I'd like to show you uh, the shaper once again. Um, however, this time killing two birds with one stone in showing how to operate the complete machine, setting speeds and feeds and such, um, showing the operations of it, showing its features, and also machining part for this very shaper. So, let's go. Before jumping into the video, I'd like to first manifest what a shaper actually is and what it does. A shaper is used to produce flat surfaces um, and it also is often referred to as the granddad of the mill because basically it does the same thing but the principle is a lot simpler than on a mill. On a mill you have a rotating cutting tool which removes the metal. On the shaper you just have a regular turning tool in the holder and uh, all the shaper does is move back and forth and advance the cut on each stroke. So, of course, it is a lot more tedious. Um, you basically can say it takes twice as long to cut because the back stroke is always a return stroke which doesn't actually produce any chip. However, it takes even longer because the cutting tool, of course, can only take so much at a time. So, it is a single point cutting tool, not like a mill, for example, which has four or even more flutes. Um, it is not as wide as a uh, mill, which basically on a shell mill can be even several hundred, hundred millimeters. On this one you just have a regular cutting tool on, like on a lathe. So yes, it is a very slow machine, however it still can be a lot of fun. And since for me as a hobbyist efficiency doesn't play any role, this was the perfect tool because no one needs a shaper anymore, so these really are dirt cheap. However, since they are very old, they are very simple and rugged and basically indestructible. So, this is one of the reasons why I decided to buy myself a shaper and not a mill. As I said before, the cutting tool is just a regular lathe tool, um, which is the second advantage of a shaper. The tools are a lot simpler, thereby a lot cheaper, and you can also resharpen them very easily not like a mill where you actually need a special grinding machine or incredible superhuman skills to sharpen one. This one, you just hit it on the grinding stone and um, it's ready to go once again. And also because the cutting motion is always in one direction and it is always linear, there are only chips flying in one direction. So with a milling machine, you basically got chips flying everywhere, you know, depending on the direction of cut, if the cutter is rotating this direction and the, it's moving that way, the chips will fly this way and when you return they're going to fly that way. So basically you've got everything covered with chips. Uh, the cutting forces are a lot higher, it's more interrupted, so the machine is louder, it needs more force, it needs more rigidity. Um, a shaper basically is very simple to a lathe, only in that it returns its stroke so um, it doesn't need to be built as tough and um, it's still going to produce very adequate surfaces. Some technical data first. The ram is capable of doing a 375mm stroke. The table is able to move left and right for 800mm and to lift up and down for 600mm which basically determines the maximum length or dimensions of the part that you are able to machine. The part we're going to make today is going to look something like this. You can see there is an angle on the side, uh, there is a keyway in here, and of course we're going to have to machine it to the overall dimensions. It's actually going to be a part for the shaper itself. What you are looking at is the uh, depth feed mechanism. This basically is no more than a ratchet and each time the ram retracts it's actually when you want it supposed to hit a stop and therefore engaging the depth feed. This stop is missing so the first part we're going to make is actually for the shaper on the shaper the depth feed carriage stop. With that we're going to move into the gadgets that the shaper actually has. We're going to start with the depth feed um, the depth feed is a pretty simple mechanism. You've got your ratchet wheel on here, which is actuated by the stop that we're going to make, which is pushing 
this ratchet mechanism back on each return stroke. Um, moving the stop on this rail here determines how many clicks on the ratchet it's going to move for each stroke, so the feed basically. And into here is going a shaft with a gear on it, which is redirecting the feed into, well, let's call it the compound slide. And it's actually, there's just another gear sticking out here and reaching into the mechanisms of this crosshead. Um, you actually saw it in the last video, I'm going to post a photo into here, right? Um, with this lever you can activate or deactivate the feed with this one as well. This just disengages the paw. This disengages the whole mechanism basically by moving the contacting gear in and out. So when I move this portion here, you can actually see the hand wheel is turning. So it's actually not doing any more than that, it's just moving the hand wheel for each stroke. Uh, this allows you not only to produce flat surfaces in the X direction, but also in the Y direction. Another gadget that this machine has is an automatic cutting tool liftoff. Since the tool isn't working on the return stroke and is also not able to cut efficiently and leaving the tool down would actually cause damage to the tool or could cause damage to the tool, they invented this little thing which basically has a rubber pad below it and is sliding on this sliding rail down here and it allows the tool to move up on the return stroke as such. Can you see this is the normal operating position and this is the position lifted up. It's not making contact with the work like this on the return stroke. The issue here is there is a rubber pad required. The old one was worn down so much that the screws would actually have uh, marred, marred up the sliding rail, which I didn't want to. The factory that this thing is made by wants to have 55 euros for it, which I am not eager to pay, so I'm going to leave this more as a decorative aid item at the moment until I find some cheaper solution, because this thing called the clapper box it's actually able to retract on its own. It's still going to rub over the workpiece on the return stroke a little bit, which might destroy the surface finish and so on, but that's how most shapers actually work, and this is more than sufficient, especially at the moment, as I'm still learning. Before starting up the shaper, you're going to inspect this uh, side glass on the ram, which is basically leveling, showing the oil level inside the ram. The ram is equipped with a system of tubes, which are actually feeding onto the dovetails. With these two screws up here, you adjust the amount of oil dripping out of there. It's basically like a carburetor with the needles. When you screw the needle out more, that means more oil is getting into the ways. Um, the entire shaper is not equipped with an oil pump, so all the oil that runs down from here actually runs into the main reservoir and fills the oil in there and every now and then you will have to drain the oil a little bit and fill it back up in the top. That's what this opening here is for. Having advanced the ram so far actually uncovers the ports for the oil that I meant. You can see there is a drop of oil coming out of there making a huge mess on the bottom right now but uh, now that it's out I just wanted to show you this is how the oil gets into the dovetails. I've taken off the side plate to allow you to take a look inside here. 
and you can actually see that it's basically full with oil just up till here and when it gets above that level you just open the drain plug and uh, let the excess flow out and put it back up in the ram and this is basically the way the whole thing gets lubricated what is not submerged in oil actually gets supported with oil by the main gear which like a huge water wheel is flowing inside the oil and slings everything up onto all the contact points and you can actually hear the oil sloshing around You are currently looking into the dovetails of the ram and these traces that you see are not actually damages but they're intended oil ports basically since the ram is tolerated to have two hundredths of a millimeter left and right which is about one thousandth of an inch um, that is a little bit too little for oil to pass through so what they've made is cut these grooves where oil can accumulate and where oil can actually also run out so the oil which is traced in here is actually forced to run out to the front run into this catcher and then through a drilled hole back into the casting so basically every drop of oil is recycled and put back into the system the same principle applies of course to the back you can see here again the grooves cut into the dovetails and all this divot is for is for catching the resistant oil and then there is a hole drilled in here so that all the oil will run back into the container 